How's it going, everybody? So, the G1 continues on, and boy, oh boy, has it been an excellent one so far. Tonight, we're going to be covering night 9 and 10. We actually recorded this a couple days ago, but I totally screwed up on the uh, settings, so... Yeah, coming back to do it again, and I guess this time uh, I will just be doing it solo because Trey has a, a cold right now and can't talk. So we're just going to bang this out. Hopefully tomorrow he will be better. We will be doing night 11, 12, and then the plan is for, or sorry, uh, yeah, 11, 12, and the plan is for Friday, do 13, 14, and hopefully we'll be pretty much caught up on all the English that is out as of right now, and we will get all of that out. Man, the G1 has just been amazing so far, but a G1 season every year is they pack 19 shows into, I believe it's actually 29 days this year. So it is a lot of wrestling to take in over such a short span of time. Luckily this year, and I hope they keep this format because it would really suck if they don't Keeping the format of just doing a Young Lion match and then going straight into the block matches. No doing the multi-man matches that is kind of setting up the following night's matches. This has just been so much better where you can get through the entire G1 show in about two hours instead of having three plus hour shows. Uh, yeah, the two hours makes it so much better. You go straight into your block matches and just with one Young Lion match at the top of the show. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. My name is Eric LaRoche. You are watching and listening to That's Wrestling. If you're listening to this as a podcast, head over to the YouTube channel because we do this show live. If you hit the bell notification, it'll let you know when I schedule a live stream or do a reschedule because that's what I had to do for this particular broadcast. But, you know, it is. Is what it is the link to the uh, channel is in the show notes of the podcast so you can go over there also if you want to send in comments question feedback all that good stuff you can send that to eric at that's wrestling.com plus there is a discord server as well link is in the show notes and description you can come hang out with us there head over to itunes and give us a review it really helps out in the search results so if you could do that, that would be really nice of you. We don't we don't have too many reviews over on iTunes at the moment. I think we just have five, but we have five five stars. So that is always good to hear. So I am going solo tonight. So let's get into it. And we're going to talk about night nine, which was on October 5th, 2020. In a, I know I'm not sure how to say... The area they were in, Kagawa, I think that's how you say it. Anyways, uh, if you watch this show, there was a cricket that came across on commentary. I'm guessing it was probably on, probably on Kevin Kelly's microphone. I was listening to it in the evening. I had my windows open and hearing crickets would be pretty normal, but it was kind of cold that evening and they usually aren't very loud when it's really cold. It was like below 50 degrees outside, and, but I did have the window open just to get some cool air into the house because the day was a bit warm. So I thought it was outside until I paused it and then the cricket stopped. And then I unpaused it and started it again. So there was a cricket on the uh, the entire two-hour show at one point. I believe one of their dogs, whether it be Rocky or Kevin Kelly, barked. And you also could hear a motorcycle drive by. So I'm guessing that was all Kevin Kelly's stuff. Uh, so that was just something interesting to point out. The Young Lion match for Night 9 started off Uemura versus Gabriel Kidd, and this was a solid back-and-forth match. Uh, at the end of the match, they exchange a ton of roll-up pin attempts, and then Uemura puts on the full crab. Kidd gets to the ropes, but as soon as he is up, 
we have you more hitting an overhead suplex and then puts back on the crab really is more lion tamer and gets the submission victory so these young lion matches continue to be really really good so it's 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 worth it checking them out and this format has made it a lot better and just being able to check out that one non-block match so good there the first block match we are in block a tonight yujiro takahashi versus shingo takagi shingo takes control right at the beginning but that once they move to the outside yujiro takes over shingo kind of went for a splash against the barricade at one point and he ends up eating the barricade instead yujiro gives shingo a Kind of a modified flatliner on the ring apron at one point, and Shingo starts to make a comeback with some strikes. They continue to go back and forth without either really gaining control for any significant amount of time. Yujiro bites the thumb of Shingo to get out of a hold, and actually later on, Shingo returns the favor, and we have another spot where he bites the finger and then pushes down the ref. Not sure how that is not a DQ that doesn't really make any sense but he pushes down the ref Yujiro grabs his walking stick or his cane whatever you want to call it and swings it at Shingo but Shingo throws a forearm at the cane and it breaks in half so the ref bump does nothing for Yujiro and then they go on eventually Shingo hits a last of the dragon and gets the win this moves Shingo up to four points so he only has two victories after after five matches, Takahashi remains winless, staying at zero points. This uh, match was fine. I mean, Shingo Takagi can get pretty good matches out of just about everybody, and that was the case in this one where Takahashi had a pretty decent match here. And it's really coming down to Takahashi not really being able to have some sort of game plan coming into these matches. Uh, I believe Kevin Kelly was talking about that type of thing on the commentary. And he he just doesn't stick with, is he going to follow the rules the whole time? Or is he going to try to break the rules as much as possible? And whenever he does break the rules, it ends up backfiring on him anyway. So it doesn't really matter. But we have uh, Shingo getting the points here. We move on to a really excellent match. Once again, we have Jay White versus Jeff Cobb. And White tries to take down the Olympian with a single leg. Right at the beginning, it basically he's just hugging Jeff Cobb's leg because uh, it really gets him nowhere. Cobb pulls White away from the ropes, um, and Gato grabs onto Jay White's leg to try to prevent him from being dragged into the middle of the ring. But Gato ends up getting dragged at, on, on Jay White's foot, so he they both end up getting dragged into the ring. But, uh, oh, and then he gives them a meeting of the minds and, and Gato rolls out of the ring. And after just a little bit, Gato ends up holding Cobb while he is uh, running the ropes. And this is where Jay White starts to take advantage and runs Cobb into the barricade when they're on the outside. And then Cobb starts to make a comeback with some suplexes, but White Cuts him off with a DDT, and then White hits a suplex in the corner, then Blade Buster for a two count. A little more back and forth. White hits a Uranagi, and then Cobb does the same move that he did with Ibushi uh, on their previous match, where Jay White was kind of holding on to the second rope, and when he pulled him away from the corner it popped him up in the air he catches him like a baby and just tosses him and then hits a standing moonsault for a two Cobb goes for tour of the islands and white uh counters it to attempt a blade runner but Cobb counters that and hits a suplex gato gets involved and uh, during the distraction, Cobb ends up eating a Saito suplex. Cobb turns it right around, though, hits Tour of the Islands, and Gato pops up and tries to get into the ring to stop the pin. 
So Cobb picks up Gato and just throws him at Jay White as he stands up. Then he hits a, another tour of the islands on White and gets the victory. So we have Jeff Cobb picking up the victory over Jay White. Jay White drops his last two matches in a row. So he stays at six points and Jeff Cobb moves up to four points here. And by the end of this night, the the crowd sitting at six points gets very crowded. And um, yeah, it was it's a five person race sitting there at six points with only one person hitting eight points by the end of this night. So interesting way how they're setting it up this is just how gato likes to book the g1s anyways you really have no idea how it's going to go and it's going to come down to that last night as it has for the past few years now so this uh continues to be the case here with with white sitting at six points and we'll talk about the rest of the people who are sitting at six points when they come up so the next match we have is Minaro Suzuki versus Kuzuko Okada. And they mentioned that Suzuki only has one singles victory over Okada. And that was all the way back in 2013. So Suzuki has not beaten Okada in seven years. And it was only once in the entire time that they've ever faced off. So interesting, uh, interesting stat that they give out here. They start off with a bit of a uh, bit of mat wrestling and Suzuki baits Okada into a striking exchange. Suzuki takes Okada to the outside, does what he normally does, runs him into the barricade, gives him a boot and all that fun stuff. Suzuki starts to attack Okada's arm and he lays in some kicks into the shoulder and then drops an elbow across the arm. He kind of wants to damage Okada's arm as much as possible so he can't lock on that money clip or be able to hit the Rainmaker. So that seems to be Suzuki's strategy. They go into a striking exchange, each throwing like 10 forearms apiece, and Suzuki hits his last two super, super hard on Okada. Okada drops to a knee after them. Um, again, these are some of the loudest forearms Suzuki has thrown, especially that one that during the Ishii match was just insane how loud that was, you know, hitting somebody in the neck with a forearm. Suzuki puts on a rear naked choke, but Okada gets out of it and hits the backpack neck breaker that he likes to do. And then they go back to trading strikes once again. Suzuki gives Okada a bunch of free shots. He's putting his hands behind his back and he just gives Okada like five free shots to, to take. And then eventually Okada hits a drop kick and then a spinning tombstone puts on the money clip, but Suzuki escapes putting on an arm bar. So going back to that arm a little back and forth for a bit. And Suzuki puts on the rear naked chokes choke with the hooks on the ground. So it looked like he was actually trying to choke out Okada in this position since he did put in the hooks and brought it to the ground instead of normally doing it in a standing position so he can hit the gotch pile driver. Uh, in this case, it looked like he was going to try to submit him. They fight for the position and Suki, Suzuki gets backdropped. And as Suzuki is trying to do a sunset flip, Okada just sits down into it and he rolls up Suzuki and gets the three count. So Okada here picks up the victory and it actually puts both Okada and Suzuki at six points. So this is where we now have White, Suzuki, and Okada sitting at six points uh, at the end of this night. And I believe we have... Uh, one, uh, two more people who will be joining them by the end of this night as well. So again, I mean, it's Minoru Suzuki and Okada. I'm not sure they can have a bad match against each other since both of them pretty much always have good matches, though Okada has been a little more hit and miss since coming back from the pandemic. Um, not sure what that has to do or what that has to do with or the cause of it. 
I don't. I'm phrasing that horribly. I don't know why Okada's matches just not have geez, haven't been as quality as you would normally expect out of him. That he had some pretty lackluster matches during the uh, New Japan Cup when they came back from break and. His matches just have not been as exciting as you would expect out of Okada. Um, but here, they did have a nice, solid match. Suzuki can probably wrestle a broom to at least a three-star match. So uh, they're going to have a good match. Okada has been having his back taped up. So I'm not sure if that is a legit injury or not. There's been some speculation that it might be, though in night 11, he was not wearing the the tape. So not sure if that is just to throw off people that he is fine or uh, if he legitimately is fine. So uh, time will only tell on that. But out of the G1, I'm not expecting Okada to have too many matches between now and the G uh, between the end of the G1 and Wrestle Kingdom anyways, because they're going to be doing best of the Super Juniors and the World Tag League uh, tournaments coming up after the G1. So I'm guessing Okada probably is not going to be wrestling either at all on those shows or very much. I don't, I wouldn't expect them to do. I, I'm expecting them to kind of do what they're doing for the G1, uh, have a young lion opener and then go straight into block matches for those two tournaments since they're run, running them simultaneously and every other night is going to be the other. So they're going to do best of the super juniors one night and then the next night is going to be world tag league and they're going to go back and forth so the, they're going to be abbreviated brackets as well uh i don't think there's going to be multiple blocks i think there's just going to be one block on each uh, for each tournament instead of two blocks which is normally for the best of the super juniors which is usually run very similar to the g1 a world tag league tends to only be one block um or, or is that the junior tag league that tends to only be one block? Either way, they are, they're just going to be doing the, the smaller blocks because they're going to have to kind of cram them into the end of November going into the beginning of December. So we'll see how that goes. Anyways, moving on to the second to last match of the night, we have Tai Chi versus Tomohiro Ishii. Once again, Ishii is probably one of the best workers in the world right now. Uh, I would put him top five easy. He can pretty much drag anybody along to a uh, four-star match almost, it seems. So they start off with strikes, and they are going at each other, and Ishii is throwing chops while Tai Chi is throwing kicks. So they just go back and forth, chop, kick, chop, kick, chop, kick. It, they had to have thrown 30 apiece until finally Tai Chi drops Ishii. Uh, they go on to the outside and Ishii gets run into the barricade. Tai Chi grabs the ring bell hammer and he pushes the ref away and hits Ishii with it. So this time, at least there was a distraction, but the distraction was pushing the ref. So I am not sure how that is not a DQ. The refs get pushed on purpose quite a lot and the refs know it was on purpose. And this is just one of the things with, with New Japan that really pulls me out of the matches sometimes is why is this not a DQ? I can see if somebody pulls the ref um, with some other man, uh, some other manner, an accidental ref bump or something like that, or at least make it look like an accident. And this is just straight up abuse of the ref. So I have no idea why in every other sporting event, if a player pushes a ref, they're done. That is the end of them. They are kicked out of the game if it's a team sport. And if it's uh, a single sport, then they're disqualified. That is the end of it. And they loot, they forfeit the, the match. Um, so I have no idea why, why they put up with so much abuse in, in New Japan, where every other promotion that if it's a blatant push against the ref, 
they usually will call for the bell and do a DQ. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. This tends to happen quite a lot. Uh, tai Chi ends up choking Ishii with the ring bell hammer, and then that's when the ref steps in and takes the hammer away. Tai Chi maintains control for a while until Ishii hits Tai Chi with a million shots. And then Tai Chi reverses an Irish whip into the corner, but Ishii just comes out, totally runs over tai chi like a garbage truck and just takes him down they go back and forth for a little bit until they get to another striking exchange tai chi once again drops ishii ishii counters a black mephisto and turn and hits a power uh, a buckle bomb actually tai chi's feet actually hit the ground before he ever touched the buckle so it wasn't much of a buckle bomb tai chi pushes the ref again he tries for a low blow. Ishii blocks it and then no sells a buzzsaw kick. So Ishii takes a massive blood. Uh, buzzsaw kick while he is kneeling and nothing happens to him Ishii hits a power bomb for a two count then hits two lariats Tai Chi escapes a vertical brain buster attempt and um, we have a, uh, a double down here and uh, he actually he pushes the the ref and actually hits the low blow this time so Tai Chi has pushed the ref on purpose three times during this match so again not sure how this is not a dq tai chi escapes the vertical brain buster hits that low blow and then goes for the tai chi clutch ishii kicks out at two and this is where we have our double down tai chi hits a last ride power bomb for a two count Tai Chi no sells a German suplex, but then Ishii drops him with a headbutt. Tai Chi kicks out uh, of a pin after a lariat at one, and they keep exchanging strikes until another double down. Ishii hits a sliding lariat for two, then he hits the vertical brain buster and gets the three. So Ishii gets uh another two points and this moves him to four and this keeps tai chi at six so he joins suzuki jay white and okada sitting at six points here on the a block so and we got jumble we got traffic jam right here at six points this being the high at this point going into this last match we have kota abushi and will osprey who going into this match are both sitting at six points as well so one of them is going to remain there short exchange of holds kind of strange for kota abushi and will osprey osprey actually is starting to act a bit cocky here and osprey hits a uh a, a running kick he's running on the apron kota abushi standing on the floor so he basically hits a running penalty kick on a standing abushi then hits a flying forearm off the apron and then osprey star, uh, starts to try to put on some submissions and um just for a little bit they stand and trade and osprey goes for a low drop kick but Addy's as he's going under Abushi jumps up and hits a double stomp on Offspray. It was awesome move. Very similar to what he did, uh, I believe it was to Jeff Cobb, where Jeff Cobb kind of went in for a spear, and Kota Abushi jumped up and double stomped him in the back of the head and shoulders. Osprey goes for, or hits a pip pip Cheerio, and then a Sasuke Special and then Osprey hits a reverse bloody Sunday for a two count. Ishii, uh, sorry, Abushi goes for a springboard top rope Rana with Osprey sitting up on the top rope and Osprey lands on his feet. This is a callback to a match that they have had in the past. They've actually done the same spot before and Abushi, uh, can't believe what happened. Then they have a striking exchange. Osprey drops Abushi twice. And then we get zombie Abushi, where basically nothing phases him and he just goes crazy. And um, Osprey hits a flipping tiger kick. 
And then Ibushi hits a bridging German suplex for a two count. Ibushi hits a Balmaye for a two count. Osprey avoids a Kamagoye and then hits a hook kick. Then a power bomb for a two count. Osprey singles signals for Hidden Blade, but Ibushi has eyes in the back of his head this time. Last time, uh, Osprey basically knocked the crap out of Kota Ibushi, and it looked like he was actually legitimately out last time they met and this happened, but he ducks it and drops Osprey with a high kick, then hits a last ride power bomb for a two count. Ibushi pulls down the knee pad for a Kamagoye. Uh, Osprey gets out of it, hits a thrust kick, tries for a storm breaker, but Ibushi gets out of that. Osprey goes for an os cutter, but Ibushi hits him with a flying knee in midair, hits the Kamagoye, and gets the three. So here we have Ibushi being the first in A block to eight points, and Osprey remaining at six with the five others uh, before him, or is it four? So we have Osprey, Tai Chi, Okada Suzuki, so that's four, and Jay White. So that is five. Five people in the A block sitting at six points and Kota Ibushi being lonely at eight points at the end of this evening. So that was night number nine. Excellent match right there in the end with Kota Ibushi, Will Ospreay. I did not expect them to start off with exchanging holds and with Osprey actually <laughs> trying to put on a submission. Uh, I figured this would be a bit more high flying, but there has actually been a lot more wrestling in this G1 than previous G1s it did not. It hasn't seemed that they have been taking as big of risks as they have as they have in the past when it came to the G1 matches and they seem to be working a bit safer than we have seen in years past. Um, a lot of these guys, I, I believe everybody ex, uh, I believe, Oh, I believe there was actually no first timers in the G1 this year. So everybody has had at least one G1 before. So they probably have learned from the past on uh, how to make it through these matches and with the with the format that they're doing they are not wrestling on all 19 nights they are wrestling every other night so really only the block matches are the only matches that they are doing and they get at least one day rest in between matches and that has actually probably been a godsend for the wrestlers as well that they really only have to compete um, in nine or 10 shows in the course of a month. So that is really not that bad. That's, you know, a kind of a relatively normal schedule for a lot of promotions. If they're doing two shows a week or whatever, um, this being more like two, three shows a week. But I mean, there, you had guys like John Moxley who have wrestled 260 matches in a year. So he's wrestling more than every other day. Um, so, you know, here, here they are at least having a day break or more, and they only have to wrestle 10 matches in the course of 30 days instead of 20 matches or 19 matches. So, uh, I, I bet that they are probably liking this format as well. And hopefully it continues on night 10 takes place on October 6th, 2020 in Hiroshima. And tonight we start off with Yuya Uemura versus Yota Suji. And this seems to happen a lot of times with really, really good matches is I write down very little because the match was so good and I was so taken up by it. And there was really not one spot that really stood out. This match was a solid back and forth, exchanging lots of holds, trying to submit each other, sold back and forth, just going back and forth. This match was awesome. This is actually a match worth going out of your way to see. Yes, it's a young lion match, but you have to see these guys pull off this match. And it goes to a 15-minute draw. Yua Uemura and Yotasuji 
excellent, excellent work. And I am really looking forward to see what these guys bring in the last half of the G1 here as well, since we're going to see these two compete at least another two times. So should be good. And then, or against each other, uh, they're all going to compete actually more like six times each <laughs> since they're all going to, they're going to compete against uh, the, the other guys. So we will see how that goes down. Um, we have our first block match and this actually set a G1 record for match length. This being the shortest match in G1 history. It is Toriyano versus Toriyano versus Hiroki Goto. Yano throws the t-shirt to Goto just like he did to Juice the previous match he had. Goto throws it on the ground just behind Yano. Yano turns his back to pick it up. Goto clocks him in the back of the head and then rolls up Yano for the pin. So Goto gets the victory in 18 seconds. The a new shortest match ever record in the G1. There was a lot of speculation that Goto is really injured. His match with Zack Saber Jr., the previous match he had, only went like three minutes and 30 seconds or something. So there was some speculation that Goto actually is injured, and this is a way to allow him to to rest up a little bit and i have not seen the match yet but it was reported to me that on night 12 goto does have a regular length match so whether it was something that was just bothering him temporarily or if it was or if the injury is actually just all a work not sure at this point uh they are pretty good at blending the two and you're not really sure which way it actually is uh you know last year we had a legit where Kota Ibushi was basically wrestling on a injured ankle the entire time and still went and and won the the G1 last year so uh, but that was actually a legit injury that he got like on the first night of the G1 last year uh so it was fine. It was 18 seconds. Uh, I covered the entire match. I've been talking about the match longer than the match went. So let's move on. Sonata versus Zack Sabre Jr. Again, just like the Young Lion match, I did not write a ton because this match was awesome. If you have never seen a Sonata versus Zack Sabre Jr. match, just go find one and watch it. They are all very similar, but they are different enough that they are great to watch. The two of them always have a very good match, this one being excellent. And they just do a ton of mat wrestling. They exchange that they have a sequence where they exchange like 20 pin attempts in a row, and then a ton of submission wrestling, counter wrestling. Zack Saber Jr. starts targeting the neck using different types of attacks, be it strikes just neck cranks, submission holds. Sonata has had a history of neck problems uh, and especially having a pinch nerve in the neck. He sometimes gets pins and needles in his extremities, mostly in the arms. And uh, Sonata puts on a skull end and Z Sonata actually lets Zack Sabre Jr. flip up over him. But when he does that, Zack Sabre Jr.'s legs land on the top rope sonata hits a tower of london hits a moonsault off the top rope and gets the pin very different finish from all of their matches zach saber jr doesn't even realize he was pinned tries to continue to fight sonata after the bell as well and he has to be pulled apart by the young lions and the ref so again zach saber jr and sonata always always have very good matches against each other they are always fun to watch they like i said they are very similar and it's strange that sonata has this type of wrestling in him and you only see him pull out with zach saber jr uh i'm surprised he doesn't do it with a lot more people i i don't know if it's just something that he with doing it with Zack Sabre Jr., he's comfortable and knowing that Zack Sabre is going to be able to pull off what he wants to pull off. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, Zack Sabre Jr. He can, again, he can wrestle a wet blanket to a three-star match as well. So very good match. Definitely go check out Sonata versus Zack Sabre Jr. Whether in this G1 or any of their other matches that they've had over the past couple of years, they have all been very good. Uh, next up, we have Juice Robinson versus Evil. Evil attacks Juice from behind when he turns to throw his uh, button-up shirt to the young lion on the outside. Juice gets some offense in until Dick Togo pulls Juice out of the ring. Evil distracts the ref so Togo can beat on Juice on the outside. He runs him into some barricade. Evil actually undoes a turnbuckle pad once the ref turns his attention to the outside to see what has happened to Juice. Then Evil goes on to the outside, and then we have Dick Togo pulling the ref. Evil makes a pile of chairs on the floor, gives Juice a suplex onto the pile of chairs, and then back, once they're back into the ring, that exposed tire buckle comes into play. Juice gets run into that. Juice hits a kick and then a bunch of jabs, then a spine buster. He does a dive onto Dick Togo on the outside to, to take him out for a little while. And then Juice hits a running cannonball and then a crossbody off the top for a two count. So he has a good sequence of offense right here. Evil catches and catches a kick and tosses it over to the ref. So the ref is an unwitting participant on holding the leg and evil hits juice with a thrust kick. You'll see this in a lot of evil matches. Juice mounts a comeback, hits a superplex and then a jackhammer for a two count. Togo hits juice in the back. When the ref's back is turned, he hits him with a chair and then evil hits darkness falls for a two count. Juice attempts a pulp friction, but Evil escapes. Uh, but Juice ends up hitting him with a massive lariat. He pushes Evil into Dick Togo, who had gotten up onto the apron, and gives Evil Evil a juice box for a two count. But and then J Togo distracts the ref. Evil hits a low blow, then hits everything is Evil, and gets the win. So this finish has been way overused at this point from evil he uses it in like all of his matches at this point and it is getting very repetitive um that was really a big thing coming out of the new japan cup as well where evil's matches have felt very repetitive since coming back for uh from the break uh, the pandemic break, if you want to call it that. And, and that is one reason why his title reign, short as it was, did nothing for me. And evil as a character really does not intrigue me at all. At this point, all of the matches feel very similar. Um, the, they need to figure out some more creative ways and low blow. Everything is evil. Get the victory is so overplayed at this point that it's just getting boring or it's been boring for a long time. Now, now it's just getting, yeah, I just stopped caring. It, the, there's boring. And then there's, I don't care anymore. And I'm kind of to the, I don't care anymore of the evil, in Bullet Club with Dick Togo or just Evil with Dick Togo. Um, I don't know. We'll see. This, they, they've they been trash-talking Evil and, and Jay White have been throwing shade at each other in post, uh, post-show post interviews. So we will see what comes of those two when the G1 is over. I'm guessing there is going to be some friction within the Bullet Club uh, there probably won't be a ton up until uh, probably Wrestle Kingdom. I expect then we'll probably start seeing the Bullet Club fracture some more. We still have plenty of Bullet Club members who have not been in Japan. They have been absent, being Chase Owens, Bad Luck Fale, Tamatanga, and Tonga Loa. We haven't seen uh, El Fantasmo either. So we have a decent amount of Bullet Club that have not been over in New Japan. So I'm wondering how the 
fracture of the faction ends up working out because uh, it's probably coming where evil and and jay white are going to have to figure out who's the leader of bullet club at this juncture so look forward to that probably in the new year at least that's when i'm thinking it's probably going to kick off we are pretty late in the year and they they tend to slow play these particular storylines so i'm guessing something might happen at wrestle kingdom but i assume the mass of the storylines probably going to be post wrestle kingdom and maybe even new year's um new year's dash will be kind of the the kickoff of the dissension in bullet club as being a main full-fledged storyline so we'll see how that goes then we have a another excellent match and these last three matches um were really really good so this night i mean b block don't sleep on b block everybody's saying that a block is where it's at but b block has had some very good matches and this one being very good tetsuya naito versus yoshihashi and yoshihashi has just put in one heck of a performance during this g1 he has had some of the best matches i have ever seen him do and if he can continue to wrestle like this then we might have something here in yoshihashi and i'm hoping that's the case yoshihashi has always been kind of a little bit meh for me where and his characters he just seems out of it all the time like he, he he never shows like any emotion he always seems aloof more so than like Oka- okada just seems calm and collected where where yoshihashi seems a bit more aloof so i guess we'll see how that goes i mean yoshihashi is, he's already 38 years old so if he's going to make it up into the main event of new japan he's gonna have to do it soon he is one of the members of the never open weight six man tag champions at the moment with Goto and Ishii. So we will see how his performances go. I'm sure he's probably going to be defending those titles sometime before wrestle kingdom, uh, maybe at power struggle or yeah, I guess that was probably will be the, the next major show. So we'll see how that goes. Hopefully Yoshihashi, he can, he can get some, if he continues to wrestle like this, I could see him uh, playing in the main event um, a little bit, maybe late next year, going into next year's G1. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. But like I said, he's already 38 years old, so he he is getting up there. And, um, you know, he did have that tweaked knee earlier in the year. So we will see if that comes into play with if if that injury kind of uh, reoccurs at some point and causes some some bigger problems you know he has had some issues uh i believe he's had some some neck issues but i believe he's also had some concussion issues as well uh if memory serves me right i could be totally wrong on that so do not take my word as gospel on it but anyways tetsuya naito Yoshihashi, they start off with a bit of chain wrestling, a bit of rope running, where Yoshihashi hits a couple of tackles and then a Rana. They fight onto the outside a bit. They go back and forth, and then Yoshihashi actually starts to gain control for a while in this match. So early on, he he takes control for a while. He does a suicide dive onto the outside, onto Naito, and then Naito starts to bring it back together. He hits the sweep and the wrecking ball drop kick in the corner. Corner. That is one of his signatures. Yoshihashi hits a running power bomb for a two count at one point and then puts on the butterfly lock. This is going to come into play a lot in this match. Naito stands Yoshihashi on his head with a DDT. Just he was straight up and down when he came down with that DDT. Naito hits a draping neck breaker and then hits a spine buster. He attempts a destino. Yoshihashi counters it into a pull in lariat and then they double down. When they finally get back up, they end up having a striking exchange until Yoshihashi drops for just a second, but he gets a second wind, gets in another shot, and he hits a shoulder breaker that I have not seen anyone do for a very long time in any promotion. Shoulder breaker is 
is not a move you see very often, but it makes sense for Yoshihashi because as soon as he does that, he puts on the butterfly lock, which is tro- which is targeting the shoulders and and upper back and neck area. So that I believe he should really start to work more into his repertoire and use that as a setup for putting on that butterfly lock. It'd be a great addition for him. Uh, I haven't, uh, like I said, I haven't seen the shoulder breaker from anybody uh, for a long time. Uh, that was in my notes and I end up starting to talk about it again. Uh, Naito managed to pop his head out, but Yoshihashi moves this into a sleeper and then with the sleeper still on, hits a backstabber and then puts the butterfly lock back on. They then fight over this position for a long time. This was an excellent series right here. They actually had me going that I really thought that Yoshihashi was about to submit Tetsuya Naito. At one point, he looked like he was out. The New Japan refs take a little bit more time to call off a match when somebody appears to be unconscious. So you could theoretically as a competitor in new japan pass out but then come to and you can still continue the match whereas most other sports if you are out the match is over and they uh fight the for the position a long time naito gets this one quick burst and gets to the ropes uh Yoshihashi tried everything here and they just fought over this position. So Yoshihashi usually starts this over as on the side. And then when that popped out, he turned it in a neck breaker, hit that backstabber, put the butterfly lock on. And then he dragged Naito back into the middle of the ring a couple times. And one thing, one little thing I really liked is before they made it to the ropes, Yoshihashi stepped over the front of Naito and started cranking it down almost like a reverse guillotine. So the pressure was all on the back of the neck pulling down instead of kind of from the front of the neck, pulling it forward. Uh, so it was a really cool, he stepped over and sat basically sat in front of Naito pulling his, pulling his head down, really working that choke or that submission. And it was just an excellent thing. They went on for like three minutes in this, you know, fighting over this position. It was Great. Yoshihashi tries for a fisherman suplex, but Naito blocks it and then hits a couple of sets of his pull in elbows that he has been working. Uh, excellent move uh, added into his move set. Yoshihashi ducks an elbow and then gives Naito a headbutt and a dragon suplex and then a massive running lariat for a two count. Yoshihashi goes for the fisherman suplex again, but Naito reverses it into a reverse DDT. Naito goes for Destino, but Yoshihashi blocks that and turns it into a brain buster. Yoshihashi attempts karma, but can't hit it. Naito hits a Valentina for a close near fall. Naito then gets up and hits the Destino and gets the three. So Naito here bumping up to eight points after this match, I believe. I should probably check uh, just in case. (laughs) Um, But I'm pretty sure that was the case after this match. But again, excellent match. This is probably one of the best matches I have seen from Yoshihashi. So very, very good match. Let me check the numbers here. That was, I am one night behind here, I think. Um, But yeah, excellent match once again. And I cannot find the correct day. Oh, it was actually the first Hiroshima. That was probably a while. Uh, So after this match, yes, Naito is the first in the B block to move to eight points. But again, in the B block, we are sitting in a log jam at six points as well. Uh, That being Yano sitting at six points uh, after this show. And then both Evil and Juice Robinson have six points. Naito has eight. And by the end of this night, we'll also have one more at six points after Kenta versus Hiroshi Tanahashi. And again, I mean, this is, this match was actually really good storytelling playing up the 
the the vet who has really bummed knees at this point. Naita, uh, Kenta keeps running away like he usually does. He just powders out right as the bell rings. Tanahashi ends up hitting him with a baseball slide drop kick to the back when Kenta rolls out of the ring and has just turned his back to the ring. So Tanahashi's like, screw this, and he just gets after it. Back into the ring, though, Kenta goes after the knee of Tanahashi with... He hits him with strikes. He hits a knee breaker. He runs the knee into the post on the outside a couple times, puts on leg locks, uses the figure four multiple times throughout this match. Kenta takes Tanahashi to the outside, runs him into the barricade, wraps his leg around the barricade for good measure, continuing to attack the knee as they get back into the ring. Tanahashi finally catches a kick and hits a dragon screw leg wick leg whip of his own trying to attack kenta's base tanahashi hits a couple strikes then a somersault senton for a two count and kenta hits a desperation power slam and we have a double down kenta then goes right back to working on the knees he hits a dragon screw leg whip Uh, to Tanahashi off the apron to the floor. Tanahashi is forced to answer a 20 count and he is limping and he actually got standing up and actually his leg buckled and he fell down. He did get back into the ring before the 20 count though. Kenta hits a flying boot, then the basement drop kick in the corner and then a double stomp off the top rope for a two count. Then more attacks on the knee, puts on the figure four for the third time in this match. Tanahashi hits a desperation sling blade, and we have another double down. A little back and forth, and Tanahashi gives Kenta a dragon screw while he's locked up in the ropes. Tanahashi puts on the Texas Cloverleaf, but he has having trouble standing and being able to crank back on that uh, on that clover leaf his knee just keeps giving out and kenta manages to get to the ropes tanahashi hits a running basement drop kick of his own in the corner and then we have uh kenta using tanahashi to take out the ref so he pushes tanahashi into the ref the ref goes down tanahashi lands on top of the ref and then one of the funniest visuals was Kenta for good measure does it like runs over and just does a splash onto Tanahashi's back who is laying on top of the ref as well. So he splashes basically the two of them just to make sure that the ref is taken out. He grabs the U S title briefcase or the U S title shot briefcase and just clocks Tanahashi straight in the head. Tanahashi didn't even get his hands up. It was just a straight shot to the head. Kenta hits a penalty kick and then rouses the ref. Kenta hits a psycho knee. Tanahashi kicks out at two. Kenta hits another knee, goes for a GTS, but Tanahashi turns it into a twist and shout and Tanahashi holds on to the neck hold and then hits two more twists and shouts in a row. Then he hits a sling blade for a two count. Tanahashi goes to the top rope. He hits aces high. And then, great point of storytelling here, with his knees all messed up, he goes back to the cloverleaf, knowing that if he misses a high fly flow, that his match is over and his knee is going to be toast. So he puts on that cloverleaf, He drags Kenta back into the middle of the ring and just sits back and cranks and cranks. And Kenta has to tap out to the Texas Cloverleaf. And just to point on this match, as soon as the tap happens and the match is over, Tanahashi lets go of the hold and he just falls face first, collapses in the ring. And both of them are just completely down for the count. And it was just great. You know, Tanahashi went for this Texas Cloverleaf, put everything he had left as soon as it was over. He was just done and his body just gives out on him and he just collapses. And that is the end of the match. Kenta 
comes to, he drags himself over to the corner and he's just sitting in the corner and he has the briefcase. The briefcase has a massive dent in it. It is like cracked up the side from that headshot. Uh, eventually Tanahashi does come to, and uh, of course he takes the mic and then he plays with the crowd for what felt like another 10 minutes doing air guitar solos and um, just having fun with the crowd, sending the crowd home happy. Um, Really good finish to this show. So after night 10, we now have Tanahashi also sitting at six points over on the B block. So that puts Tanahashi, Evil, Juice Robinson, and Toriano at six points so we have four guys at six points on the b block one at eight and then on the a block same thing we have one at eight and this time we have five guys sitting at six on the a block so just a nice traffic jam right here at six with only two people one on each block sitting at eight points after 10 nights so five matches for everybody so very good g1 so far i am having an excellent time watching these matches like i said at the beginning the format oh so much easier to do to watch these shows when you can get through them in about two hours uh instead of the three hour jaunts that they've had three hour plus jaunts that they've had in the previous years having a lot of those multi-man tag matches uh, at the beginning of the show, whereas here they have one Young Lions match, three block matches, so you get six matches, six really good matches in one night, and, I mean, and that's similar to a lot of shows that you're going to go to when you go to, say, an AEW, you're going to have, they pretty much kind of do five matches on Dynamite, actually, and then uh, when they had crowds, they they would do three dark matches, so they might do seven to eight matches in a night. Here we have six, but uh, you know we have a lot of these matches going a very long time as well. So I mean, we had Zack Saber Jr. and Sonata went just under fifteen. Juice and Evil went just over fifteen. Yoshihashi and Tetsuya Naito went. Tw- just under 25 minutes and te- and Tanahashi and Kenta went just under 24 minutes. So we have very long matches. So, I mean, that is, that is a solid show. And I don't know why, if anybody would complain if they kept with this format in years going forward, I bet the wrestlers would really like it too, to give themselves a little bit of a, you know, every other day break, at least having one day in between matches just so they can rest up and all that fun stuff. Cause it is grueling and it probably makes it even worse on them when they have to do those multi-man matches as well. So that is it for night nine and 10 tune in tomorrow after the AEW post show, we're going to do the post show at seven and then probably do the, uh, the, the new Japan nights 11 and 12 either immediately after, or maybe around 9 PM Eastern, um, Stay tuned and if, watch the uh, AEW post show, and then you'll find out when the the New Japan post show is going to be. But that is our plan at the moment. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. If you're listening, this is a podcast. Head over to the YouTube channel because I do this show live, and you can come and hang out and point out when I am wrong or if I totally screw up a piece of trivia. You can drop that in the chat. Also, if you could comments, question, feedback, all that good stuff, you can send that to Eric at that's wrestling.com. If you would like this as a podcast, you can get all your favorite podcast apps. If you can't find it in your favorite podcast app, shoot me an email, Eric at that's wrestling.com and let me know. I'm pretty sure we're pretty much in all of them. Um, according to stats, I've seen downloads from something like 60 plus different Uh, podcast feeds or platforms whatever you want to call it so they are it is definitely out there so you can probably find it head over to itunes give us a review it would really help us out and uh if you leave a comment we will read it out on the show as well there's also a discord you can come hang out with and i believe that is it so my name is eric laroche thanks for tuning in be sure to tune in in the next few days as well to that's wrestling see you later guys